everybody, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. On this episode, I sat down with Michael Peterson from Pivotus. Pivotus is a digital marketing agency, and Michael and his team have been working remotely for years now. Now, this time of coronavirus and the majority of people now working from home, I thought, let's get somebody on the show who's been doing that for a while, is very experienced working remotely, who can pass on some tips and tricks that he's learned over the years to make working at home more productive and more enjoyable for everybody. So that's where we started, but we end up talking about so much more than that. We end up talking about different books that we've been reading, goal setting. We went really deep into the why behind this podcast, and um, he kind of helped us thinking through that, which was really interesting. We talked about different books that we've been reading. He talked about his lawn, karaoke in the Philippines. I think there's so much value in this conversation. There's so much wisdom that he shared. I know that you guys are going to get so much out of this one. I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Michael Peterson, and I'll see you guys in the next episode. Let me do it for you. All right, do it. Go for it. Hey guys, welcome to the Rich Bryant podcast. My name's Michael. I'm the guest. And over there on the other side of the screen is the man who doesn't like talking about himself, but the man himself, Rich Bryant. So over to you, Rich. Let's get this show on the road. Mate, you absolutely nailed that. <laughs> I'm going to pull you in. I'm going to pull you in for all that, all the episodes of that. Mate, <laughs> Mate you, I can do your pre roll. I can do your pre roll for you. There you, go. there you go. You're my first remote guest, my first remote employee, potentially. See how we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cheap these days, too. So whatever. Yeah, no. Well, there we go. We're starting. So it's, anyway, thanks so much for coming on, man. It's a, uh, it's an absolute pleasure. And after that intro, I don't know how to follow up on that. But um, right, yeah. Fair enough. We've known each other for a while now. We were just talking before, I guess we started recording that we kind of chat at these sort of gatherings here and there, but we've never really sat and had a, a good conversation. So here we are. Mm. Tonight's the night. You're uh, it is. graced. I'm graced with your presence. So but I guess the... <laughs> well, I know a fair bit about you because I'm you know, watching the podcast, listening to the audios. I basically feel like I'm an a tra- a apprentice electrician. I can talk about all the pranks that they play on electricians. <laughs> You're right. You're surprised you're a... how people know about you now. Yeah, it's scary. I have to like, I don't want to filter anything, but I kind of have to be like, hmm, do I want people knowing this about me? <laughs> By episode one hundred and something, it'll be a bit full on. So, <laughs> but anyway, the reason I kind of wanted to get you on just to just just to chat is also you know catch up. But in this crazy time that we're at, everyone's kind of stuck in stuck at home, like you and I both are right now, and. A lot of most of us are working from home, and uh, th- that's been a big change for a lot of people. Going from an office into, you know, we've got all these people, and your boss maybe potentially walking past and looking over your shoulder to keep you, keep you motivated and stuff. But you've been running a business now for quite some time, and for quite a few years now, this has been your normal reality, hasn't it? Working remotely. Yeah. So I thought. Yep. Michael's probably an expert at working from home <laughs> or working remotely. So I'm here to hear some of your story about the business, but also get some tips and wisdom because, man, I'm, I need it at the moment. So yeah. first off, Pivotus. So this is your, this is your business. It's on yeah. your shirt. It's on, written on oh, your shirt there. Sorry. Is- I've only got five of my shirts and then 12 of your shirts. So that's pretty much all I own. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, that's about what you need. Which that's great. Yeah, pretty much. It so what is this. what's Pivotus? Tell us about that. Uh, well, now it is a digital advertising agency. So we work for predominantly for corporates or for creative or media agencies, and we do either their advertising uh, if it's for the corporate itself, or if it's an agency, we do their clients' advertising. So they might be an expert on something else, creative or offline media buying or something like that. And then when they have a part that they can't do, they come to us. Yeah. So what sort of, yep. what sort of advertising? So advertising on TV, advertising on the internet? Now, all digital stuff. So not TV as we historically know it, but TV on the iPad or catch up TV. So all across yep. your seven, nine, 10, SBS, all those sort of the apps. So yep. we can do um, 
which is called BVOD, so catch up TV there, through to anything you can get digitally. So YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Um, we, we're a specialist in the sort of advertising. It's called programmatic advertising. So that's okay. kind of like a, a stock exchange for ads. What literally okay. is an exchange for ads where you're buying and selling them in real time and using data and all this sort of stuff. So um, I suppose our, one of our points of difference is that we bring all of those. I mean, there's plenty of people that can buy Facebook ads. It's actually not that technical. Uh, like yeah. Make it sound like it is. You, but we bring it all together. And we, we don't, we're not a rep for Facebook or a rep for YouTube. We work out what's best for the campaign or what's best for the client. And we, we do that. And okay. then we can amalgamate all the, all the data together and then present their data back to them about what results they're getting, all that sort of stuff in one central point as well too. So, so they can see all their kind of analytics, everything like that. Cause you know, I've only had experience with running these kind of, you know, $5 Facebook ads or something, yeah, which yeah. is kind of what uh, Ga right. Gary Vaynerchuk told me to do. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and go to Garrett have, sales. Yeah, Garrett Garrett sales. I'm right into baseball cards right now as well. Which is <laughs> oh, no, no, no Next I'm not at all. And, and yeah. and I'm gonna start a um, a business called uh, Be a Library TV or something. I think. Yeah, something. Yeah. Like it sounds original. Yeah, he won't mind it. I think. But um, <laughs> so what's so the difference? I remember when I did that Facebook ad, for instance. You know, you would kind of set your budget, target who you want to target do that sort of thing so you guys do that on a i'm guessing on a bigger scale but also you have a lot more brains and science and people who actually know what they're doing behind that Just yeah so yeah. sort of because what those platforms are really good at and even when i do it because i'm the five dollar guy just like you are just me personally i'm not an advertising don't have an advertising background or marketing background or anything like that but so what they're really good at and whether it's facebook instagram linkedin any of those platforms where it's like oh for seven dollars you can reach 27 million more people sort of thing they're really really built to just make it easy for you to spend your money yeah and most people it's the the money chasing money and seven dollars and maybe i could get fifty dollars more i could get better results and you just end up spending more and more and more it's kind of like yeah it's like a drug or casino or something like that what we do particularly because we're spending other people's money is a lot more objectively Yes. Um, so yeah, it can be much bigger money. It can be a hundred, you know, we're spending thousands of dollars a day on Facebook. Well, and, and you know, that's nothing in the scheme of things is people spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a day on Facebook. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's probably a bit more objective, but then also we do work for some schools and they're not big. Um, so their budget's not huge, but we just have a few different strategies and tactics that we've learned over time. That mean we probably do things better than just the, choose your own adventure thing that yeah. those platforms make that, you do. Yeah. That money that you do spend goes a lot further than, because yeah, oh man, you're talking about how it's like a, yeah, how, how it's like a drug. The amount of times that every, every time I post something, Facebook go, pops up and goes, you know, it says you have five notifications. I'm like, oh yeah, that's five comments from people. And it's actually Facebook going, you could boost this, boost this page uh, for this much. And I'm like, hmm. I've been down that road before. And it yeah, didn't work it's, um, well. it's annoying. It's a they just they, they've got a lot more staff than you or me in our businesses, and, and it's not. And I'm not just talking Facebook. You know, by the way, I'm talking all sorts of platforms. Um, yeah. And their job is to get you to spend your most important thing on the platform, which to quote Gary Vee is your attention. Yes. And when you saw that notification you then went in and you then went through. So it's all starting with those alerts and yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I have this and the stuff we do with data is pretty insane too, but um, have this kind of split brain thing where you're like, I'll find out about new, some new data tactics or working out how you can get people who've been to this particular street address and stood within this five square meter spot. Anytime in the last two years, you can send ad campaigns to them, even if they're now living, on the other side of the country yeah. or whatever it is you hear all those sort of cool things or you're working about you know flybyers data and Woolworths data and credit card data and all sorts of cool stuff get fired up about it and recommend it to our clients and then in the other side of your brain you're like oh, i'm a consumer and i'm a dad and i'm this sort of stuff and i'm like <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're not having social media accounts and you're not doing this and you're not doing that and um, that would be a challenge i imagine that would be that could be a challenge sometimes yeah 
Well, it is a, I mean, it's the same as, I mean, my phone's not on here, but it's probably still listening to me. It's a Google, so um, it's definitely listening to me. And, um, but Sergi. it is that sort of, a, say again. Sergi and his mate, I can't remember the founders, yeah. but they're, yeah. they're listening directly. Larry. 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 So they're like, um, you know, they, um, sorry, just threw me. I just remembered one <laughs> of the memes from um, the Facebook <laughs> Senate inquiry with Zuckerberg. <laughs> so many good memes come out. One of the best ones I love was that, hey, you know, his haircut. And there's a meme of like, I, res- I love the fact that this guy's a gazillionaire and he still gets his mum to cut his hair. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Hey, You're like, have you seen that? Um, oh, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a little tangent, but have you seen those? I think, um, we're, I think we're already on a tangent. So let's just yeah. down. Have you seen those bad lip reading videos on YouTube? Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I love have you, the one where he's in Congress getting uh, the deposition. Have you seen that one where oh, they It was, they, I probably, oh. I deep dived on them, whatever oh. it was, 18 months ago, two years ago. That's Do yourself a favor. Yeah, yeah go, on, go and search that one out after this. It's so funny. I've now never the other looked one, at Mark Zuckerberg the same after that. <laughs> the other ones that are good are the guys, um, the laughing, I um, think he's Hispanic guy with the teeth missing sort of stuff. Have you seen oh. that on YouTube? And they overlay like the text at the bottom is whatever the topic of is today. Like it's Corona at the moment. The one I lo- watched was the first one was when Apple released the new laptop that didn't have a whatever oh, port on it. USB and said you need something. to buy, yeah, you need to buy new cables. And he's, <laughs> so he's laughing, everything's all the same, but they just overlay whatever the topic of the day is. <laughs> yeah. It's <flipping> hilarious. <laughs> I don't even like... watch it with the sound on anymore because I just know that he's, laughing uh, i wish i could be that creative when it comes to those things uh yeah that's i always look at these things come out within seconds of something going wrong or you watch the footy or something and then within seconds of something happened there's a you know in the state of origin stuff there's a blues meme or maroon's meme or something and you're like there's some uh, smart people out there just really yeah really you know, intelligent i heard, I heard on the radio be- that um i can't remember his, which artist it was but it was some rapper in america quite a famous one he had hired one of his employees was employed just to find and create memes because this really? guy like, well, yeah, this guy loves memes and he's the sort of guy who's like, you know, here's this, this employee goes and gets my tigers for me. And this guy here, oh, you know, he's, I can't remember the name of him, but they're the like, meme, he's the meme guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He sort of has way too much money and just spends it on ridiculous things. But um, oh, there's some life yeah. goals there about having having your own meme guy. Oh yeah, incredible. But um, so how'd you get into how'd you get into what you're doing? So you said you're not really like a marketing like no. guru. How'd you end up there then? Um, it was it's probably a bit of a long story, which I'll go through. We've got a bit of time, but um, yeah. uh. I've, my background's in sort of retail, I suppose, and but management in retail, and then, and more interested in the customer service side of that. So I've always been interested in customer service and and the sales side of customer service, as in influencing customers to do what you want them to do. Because, and part of that is by giving them great customer service. So even when I worked at worked at Big W for a few years in management there. And even while I was there, I just, I was one of the few people who'd like get really involved in the displays and merchandising and mm. all that sort of stuff, because, you know, I need, I get paid to sell these video cassettes. How can I merchandise it better to sell heaps of them? So yeah. I just love that. And then, and then from there, I went over to um, recruitment. I wanted to leave there and I went and met with a recruiter. I didn't even know what they did. And she called me back and said, um, Hey, have you ever thought about recruitment? And I remember where I was walking at the time I was walking in, uh, Calvar Central Shopping Centre. I was like, "What are you actually doing? Who pays you, and why would they pay you for what you do? Like, you're just having a chat." And um, so then I started working there, and that was awesome. I love that. I worked for recruitment for about four years. Did yeah. really, really, re- really well. Um, it was yeah, selling people for a living, which was fun. <laughs> Except prior to that, I was selling like toasters and DVD players and stuff, and those things did what you said. Like the toaster makes toast you know, it's pretty straightforward yeah yeah when you're selling people and they don't do what you said they could do like if you say they're going to turn up at the interview at this time when they get the job they can do this this and this all that sort of stuff and then they don't do it it's like that was annoying yeah so i just found people that would quite be frustrating yeah because then yeah. It, they that directly impacts your reputation as well 100 100 yeah. and that's even what i got at the moment because the digital ad 
industry is so there's so many variables compared to what we used to sell which is newspaper advertising and it's like someone books it they send the creative the creative turns up in the paper two days later job done like it was yeah it's pretty simple. and you've now, got so you've got only a, a small amount of lines of text or whatever it is fitted in that they have a pretty constant idea of who's buying a newspaper that sort of thing whereas now it's less variable less variables yeah. whereas yeah. humans when i was in recruitment was just way too many variables but i loved it and it was um yeah it was one of my favorite jobs um yeah it was yeah it was good that was a good old days um <laughs> working in the city you know making great money not working that hard you know how long ago was that do you reckon um i think it was probably 2000 and uh 2002 to 2000 and nah i remember i was selling vcrs when it was the y2k bug in 2000 so yeah, you were, you're too young to know what a vcr is let alone the y2k nah, but it's like, i know what a vcr is you know a vcr is I, I taped over my parents like um wedding, wedding video. yeah we had like a holiday video and i'm pretty sure we taped like um v8, v8 supercars or something over it or rage something like that my yep. parents were furious yeah yeah so yeah i remember i was in retail then because i was selling vcrs and if you just had this sticker on it, it said y2k compliant like people would just buy it it was so <laughs> yeah. it was easy it was like you know sand in the desert or whatever it is y, but anyway y2k um, compliant that's the best but that was a thing that was a legit thing it was yeah. It was, yeah, I still remember taking the family VCR down to the VCR repair guy down near Wynnum to get it yeah, yeah. tested and got a sticker on it and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, so that was 2000. So probably 2001 to, to it's, yeah, it's four years, finished up about 2005, I think. Or just before. Yeah. Anyway, that was, that was heaps of fun. Um, yeah, right. And then from there, I got headhunted to go over to Seek for a while, the Seek job platform, because they like recruiters, you know what you're talking about there. And then I went there and it was just not my cup of tea. They were not my sort of people. And it wasn't um, it wasn't sales. It was like, you could get a trained monkey to do it back then. Because yeah, right. when they're number one, it's like, do you want to buy it or you don't want to buy it? It's a $350,000 contract. And if you don't have that amount of money, we'll just decrease what we're giving you to suit your budget. Like there was no dance. There was no yeah. anything. So I left there only a few months and then um, my wife, well now wife, girlfriend at the time was working at a company called JF Media, which is a media sales company, which is fast forward is the same company, right? So JF Media was a media sales company and they represented different newspapers and magazines and all this sort of jazz. Um, and that was been around since 79. So she started there when she was 19, worked for the owners, which was, who was a couple. And then, um, yeah, when the, the lady um, got cancer and ended up passing away and we were quite close. It was in sort of, you know, Kate was her PA and there was only a few staff. So that was from when she was 19 to 23, 24, something like that. And um, so we were you know, in the bedroom the night she passed away, all that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. sort of rocked us and, and even more so the husband, and obviously. Um, but then what happened through that is they worked out that, Kate was integral to their business and there was only a couple of staff anyway. So Kate became a shareholder and a director, a minor shareholder and a director. And then yeah, that right. became me sort of behind the scenes, seeing how it all worked. And so in, oh, I started working there a little bit part-time, part-time recruitment, part-time there, but that doesn't work. Part-time in sales doesn't work. Yeah. Um, because you know, customers don't care if it's your, Tuesday job or Wednesday job, are they going to call? They're going to call. And so yeah, you should exactly. serve them that way as well too. But then you're taking calls about BRW magazine while sitting in a recruitment firm and recruitment calls while you're sitting in an advertising company. And it sounds like from your, even from the way that you ex explained how your attitude when you were at Big W, you, you, you care about those customers. Like you care about the experience that they're getting. So you're not yeah. the sort of person to just go, this is my day off. I'm not answering the phone kind of thing. Like, Oh, heck, oh, heck no. Um, and I suppose also because I've been in the sales side of it as well. So if you don't serve them, you don't sell them. If you don't sell them, you don't, you're not there for your base seller. You're there for base plus com. So yeah, that's important as well too. So yeah, it's been, it's really weird that I'm, I mean, I'm not by nature the best sort of people person and you know, I like one-on-one -on -one conversations, but if it's one to eight, I just get really uncomfortable with that. But um, 
but um, yeah, bigger crowds are actually easier because when I talk in front, if I've spoken in front of thousands before, I do it and I just got to see them as one. You know, you see that as one crowd, not but seven or eight people. Is just yeah, I, I do that even like when I, like hmm. yeah, me like talking in front of say, and I'm, ex, I'm an extrovert, but me talking in front of say 30 people, I find it way harder than playing guitar up on in front oh, of yeah. a few hundred because yeah, I don't, right. even though I know a lot of them, I just, like, I have never been nervous from that because, and people yeah, have gone, cool. because I'm like, what, what? They're just like, they're just looking at, well, they're not looking at me necessarily. Maybe yeah, they're cool. looking at the light shining off my head. That's probably the most distracting, but um, I don't see that as like, like I see that as just a room of people or like a yeah, yeah. group of people. Yeah. It's interesting how the brain kind of, I don't know, separates that somehow. Or, I don't yeah. Know. yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose I got over that line. I mean, I want a formidable, what's the word? Important part of our life, pivoting part of our life, whatever it was, is Kate and I had a, an Amway business actually, like a network marketing business for about 10 years and did pretty well in it by sort of normal standards. And, um, and that's where I learned, that was when I was in retail and it was that transition from retail into, you know, the hours there were just too crazy. So I, that was one of the other motivators to get out, but how I got into recruitment, because you're dealing with people. And um, when you're in network marketing, well, some network marketing is all about the product, but for me, I wasn't interested in washing powder and vitamins and crap like that. I was more interested in the sales plan and the incentives and the people side of things. So you learn, you're reading all these books, you're learning all this stuff about your own personality, goal setting, um, all this sort of stuff. My boss in recruitment would say, see if you know anyone. He, he, he literally said to me, see if you know anyone from that networking thing you do who might want to work here because I brought my brother into the business as well too and he yeah. smashed it. It's just, whereas meanwhile, the, the people in recruitment are just learning like how to process a resume, how to enter information in a database, which has got nothing to do with anything. No, it's, it's you take the step. It's a step it, back, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So that's probably what I've been more interested in, and it gets to the advertising part as well too. Is that while I get the concepts of advertising and I know the concepts of marketing, and after you know 10, 15 years, it's you know probably a little bit more than that. I'm nowhere near the depth that you know trained marketers are at, and you know, and and people who've worked in advertising agencies for decades are at at all. But because I'm more interested in the concepts before that. Like yeah. the business development side of things or the, the overall strategy or, you know, heaven forbid asking them about the business fundamentals of why they're advertising. No one wants to advertise. Yeah. They want to do something else and they've got to advertise to get that something else. That's exactly. so that's the part I'm interested in there. So it's like a, advertising is like a means to an end, isn't it? It's like a, not, a, not, that's not the right word. A means to an end. Well, like, what I put in this Facebook group the other day, which kind of got, heckled pretty bad but it was a bit of a tease but it was like saying that face well, advertising is a tax you pay for not being a good marketer now yeah. that's probably the contentious topic when you own an advertising agency but at least i'm aware of that and that's the how i come to discussing with marketers and whatnot is that if i can help them spend less with us because of my advice they're going to spend less with us for a longer period of time yes and that's more interesting to me because i'm in the long game not in the I need to make my commissions a quarter game. So yeah, playing that um, so, playing that long game, aren't you? Like that's uh, a that <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah yeah yeah. That's 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 the way to do it, I think, isn't it? That's a sustainable way to do things. Well, it works, particularly in sales. I mean, jumping around a bit, I suppose one of the things that other thing the same boss said to me. Um, he said the biggest tip I can give you in recruitment is um, don't change your phone number, don't change your email address, mm. because people come back. And I only had four years there, but I had plenty of times where I was placing people in their second job or dealing with a, a recruit of a HR manager more than a lot more than once. And I suppose that's in advertising as well, too, is it's just, I mean, I'm 40 now, I've become one of those old guys, you know, I'm one of the old guys who've been around a little while. We're in our little niche and we're not at the Woolies, Coles, Combank sort of a level, but sort of been around a while. But um, I suppose we were the, you know, to go back on JF Media, just to close that loop off. Um, so I went in and worked there. When our boy was born in 08, Kate and I both had time off work, um, which was nice. And then we bought out the, the, the older guy um, who yeah. was the, the owner of the company. 
and he wanted X amount over three years and it didn't work for us. So we just said a little bit less, not much less, but a little bit less for you know, now. Yeah. And so a few months later, he was gone and we owned the company and I nearly went bust the first quarter because I nearly spent all the money because I didn't know about bass and I thought all the money in the bank was our money and then you get a bass bill for like $35,000 or whatever it was back then. And you're like, oh, all right, so that money isn't ours. <laughs> That's not so good. Um, the so joys of well. business ownership, eh? Right. Well, that's the other thing is that if you're a technician, like if you if you said I was a technician, it would be in the maybe in business development sales, possibly. That would be the area of expertise. Um, and it's broadened out now to be a bit more general business. But you go in as a technician, whether you go in as an electrician, you start electrical contracting business, doesn't mean it's going to be successful because you're a good electrician. There's a no. fair chance it's going to be highly unsuccessful because you spend too much time you're too, you know, you're too yeah. down in the tools and not up in your marketing and your brand growth and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, so we went and bought a GFC happened, which you're still too young for that as well too, I suppose, but the GFC in 08. Um, I yeah, I was, eight, I was 18 in 08. So well, yeah, I was, uh, oh, I wouldn't like have a... been a good time. Wouldn't have been a good time to be entering the job market. That's for no, sure. No, I think I was like a, I think I was like a second year apprentice or something. So it didn't affect me too much. Up. Yeah. yeah, work dried up, but I think because I was an apprentice, I was so cheap, like I yeah. cost nothing. I yeah. made it. I made it through that. But I think if I was, yeah. I remember like some of the fourth year apprentices because they were kind of a bit more expensive. Yeah, they were the ones that got put off and things. So, yeah, it paid at the moment. At that time, it paid to be earning nothing, and uh, yeah, no, I wasn't very good at my electricity. You picked your cycle. You picked your cycle well. So yeah, yeah. so we bought it in the middle of our eight. September came and it, you know, a month later, markets took a big dive. The guy we spent, we gave hundreds of thousands of dollars to, lost hundreds of thousands of dollars anyway. So it's kind of like neutral. I shouldn't have even given it to him. But yeah. Um, anyway, so there's that. And then since then, we had another, we had our twins in quick succession. So then we worked out that two things happened. Kate and I aren't really great at working together. Um, and also she's better at breast, breastfeeding than me. So she stayed home. Surprise, surprise on that one. Well, I know, I know both things were astounding. So um, she, she stayed home and I took over the business um, and then just had to make it work. Had some good core staff and just had to make it work. And we've changed and pivoted, I suppose, um, a number of times since then. But we kicked off this digital site. We used to sell millions of dollars a year in newspaper advertising, magazine advertising, SBS TV, mm. all sorts of stuff. Um, and then we've, we, we started this digital division in 2012. I just had a brain fart and decided to start this thing off. And then it's probably a good thing later, to it, do. Yeah. Well, press was declining a little bit and digital was taking off, but no, we didn't even know what it was. I mean, in Brisbane's a bit slow compared to Sydney and Melbourne still, but even more so back then. And, I just saw what was going on in Sydney, Melbourne overseas and, and overseas and then thought, well, I could probably do that up here. So started this programmatic division and it was just a lifestyle business for a while. I mean, it's never been the goal to work the hardest or be the richest man in, in the, in the, in the cemetery or anything like that. So yeah, just, I suppose that's when, yeah, it started the digital side and the, the non-digital element wrapped up maybe three years ago now, four years ago now. Mm. Um, and digital's sort of all we do. It's the thing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Yeah, I got a heap of staff and all that sort of jazz. Yeah. So on to that. That's probably a good little segue. So you guys oh. don't have an office. You all work. This is your office. What you're in right now. Yeah. Yep. So you're pretty. You're pretty used to this whole working from home thing. I'm guessing. Yep. So we closed up our office in I think it was October 2014 because Kate and I and the family were moving to France. So we went and lived in France for all of 2015 and half of 2016. And while we did that, we, um, we actually took a 60% revenue cut a couple of months before that. It was um, pretty scary times. Uh, so part of cost saving was get rid of the office as well. So we set up the, I think we had four or five staff at the time, set them up in their homes. Yeah. Um, maybe four yeah. staff set them up in their homes and then our home was in France. And then when I came back from France, middle of 2016, I'd recruited a couple of extra people since then. Uh, and no one wanted an office again. Everyone wanted to work from home. So awesome. Yeah. 
That's good. That whole we got um, a little we got a little office in the city, a few hundred bucks a month. That is is a great spot just to have in the city. But I go there once a month, twice a month. Yeah, probably it's good to have kind of like a, a an offsite space, I guess, as well, where you can kind of meet with people and meet mm. with clients and customers and things mm. like that. Yeah. Well, also in sales, unless you've got some fandangled thing to show them generally you're going to your customer anyway because you're selling their buying. So you want to yeah. meet them where they're at. So yeah, um, we have had a few offsets. It's been really handy a couple of times and really just went, you know what, there is an element to this. There is a classy element to having somewhere to go when we've had a, you know, an important client that couldn't use their office. And I said, hey, you can just pop into ours. Yeah. And then other people who appointed us when they found out that I had some centralised place as well too. So um, but yeah, no real office. I got a I own another company with a same brand, but it's kind of like a franchise. But I own a, another company in Perth with a business partner, and we've got an office over there. They prefer they don't have much traffic in Perth, so they prefer going to an office and bonding and doing all that sort of fun stuff. So it's been interesting to see them do what you're doing, which is go from being in an office, even though it's the same company that been in an office. Now they're working from home, and how cute it is just to watch them do that because they have like crazy shirt day and funny hat day and all this sort of stuff. It's whereas, all quite novelty, know, isn't it, for them? Yeah. Uh, I just think it's so cheesy, but it's not cheesy in a bad It's cheesy, but it's kind of like that's what that team, it, it's part of that arc that they need yeah. to go through and it's so important. And I've seen Kate do it working from home here. Um, it's funny to watch, but we probably did it six years ago too, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Well, I remember the, the place I used to work at, we had some... Um, guys who worked offshore for us, like in in, yeah, Miller, yeah. in the Philippines. And yep. um, I remember when we first recruited them, so we, we'd never recruited anybody like that. And the same yeah. sort of thing. It was all this novelty, like, oh, we were using Skype to do everything, which I now know is like the clunkiest thing when it came for us. <laughs> it's, where you, it's where everyone starts tomorrow. Yeah. And so we would do these things and it, it, things would take so long. But then it must have been six years later or so, it was just normal. And people would yeah. say to us, oh, are they your virtual employees or your virtual? Oh. I was like, no, no, no. They're just an employee. Like, I don't see them as virtual or anything. They're just a, an employee. Uh, I think that's going to probably one change. one of my little irrits in our industry because I'm in this wanky entrepreneurial space and in different forums and things like that. And the VA word just oh, yeah. really, but it, I mean, it's it, because... I understand why it exists, but it just irritates me. And it, it's, all, it's, it's almost terrible. like, yeah, like people they say the way the way i've heard it used as well they're like oh you know just go and hire a, a va or just go and hire this or go and do this and they're like well hang on is it is it a virtual assistant or is it just an assistant who like lives in a different country and works with so, let, let, let's so it's even better now when you've got COVID, right so i'm guessing your wife danny's now working from home so yeah. it does her boss now call her virtual danny yeah <laughs> no exactly because isn't the same thing isn't it the same yeah. thing yeah that's what i mean it just shows how stupid it is yeah it's like no he's john and he works in accounts or he's yeah. lawrence and he's a data analyst or whatever like yeah anyway. it's it's fascinating and um i think it i think surely a lot of that's going to change like well i hope i hope a lot of that changes now that everybody's kind of been forced to go virtual or remote yeah and they actually will see, well, hang on, this person who's been my virtual assistant or virtual Denny for so long, they're putting out exactly the same output and I'm having the same relationship and experience with them as the person who used to sit next to me in the office. Maybe they are equals right now. <laughs> like, yeah, oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we've got, I mean, we've got stuff in, in, in Sydney as well too. And it's interesting, like I'm working on a, a tender at the moment for something going on in Tasmania. And to me, most other companies who go for that tender wouldn't put a staff member on in Tasmania for it. Um, it wouldn't make sense based on the economics of it um, and the market and all that sort of stuff. But to me, it's like, well, I'm going to have to get someone to work on it, you know, 50, 75% of the time anyway. And I don't care if they're in Tasmania or they're in Townsville, like it makes no difference to me. Yeah. But then but Tasmania actually gives a small benefit over here because you can say to the Tasmanian client, look, I've got someone there. Um, but the Townsville client who needs work done, they don't care. So it's, yeah, it's, um, it is different though, because when you, 
don't have, you haven't physically met, like I've been to, we've got six staff in Manila as well too. Um, and I've got, I think five staff in Manila, six in, in Queensland, three in Perth and, and one in Sydney. But I've been to, and visited, like I have a physical, personal relationship with these people. I've been yes. to you know, lunch a couple of times in Sydney. I've been out putt-putt in Perth. I've done karaoke in, in Manila. Um, yeah. So you have that shared experience, which is difficult to get just on video. It, yeah. It, that's, that's true. I would say that's the, yeah, we did that at the, the company I used to work at. Um, we were very intentional about really incorporating them into the company. So, yeah. you know, we um, flew somebody over there to, because yeah. the company that they um, work for, so it's sort of like offshoring well, I know, company. I know the guys. I know the guys yeah. and they're owned by Aussie guys. So yeah. that helps as well too, is that, that there's that cultural pass on i suppose yeah exactly and so we sent a guy over as well to kind of meet them help here's your computer set them up a bit here's a beer yeah. this sort of thing and yeah. then um they, then they were going good and then my boss because we only had three or two at the time my boss invited them over for our christmas yeah trip. so we all went to strati or i think it was morton island or something yeah and we noticed their their like productivity but also just their buy into the company that year afterwards was insane. Yep. We were like, what the heck are these guys drinking? Like, they've just, well, and it was all because they were now part like of the company. Me. Yeah, they're humans just like you and me. So it's like the same for whether they were isolated in Sydney. You know, it doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't um, matter. Yeah. You've touched on a sore point though with um, the old COVID stuff because in uh, a month and a half time, I've spent nearly $30,000 booking uh, a trip for 17 of us to Barakai in the Philippines where it was going to be our first first ever one of these team oh. you know get togethers on an exotic island and people coming from Manila and Perth and Sydney and Brisbane and all the flights accommodation booked accommodation amazing we can't do it no that sucks <laughs> Will you get refunded on most of that stuff or you don't know? Uh, the, the airlines are not, we're going through a, a travel agency, a company called Mission Travel. They've done a really good job from a customer service point of view. I wouldn't want to be in the travel industry that just, it's just getting slaughtered. No, it's, it's right. um, so we've got, I think the easiest way for them to at least get paid a little bit of money is to get a refund rather than a credit. I'm assuming with a credit, they don't make any money, but when it's refunded, they can keep some of that money. So we've got refunds for, Singapore Airlines and Qantas, but Air Asia is like there's a waiting list of days before they'll even ring the travel agents back. So I'm wondering about that one. I might keep some credits there. <laughs> yeah. And the accommodation, I've booked it all through the head office in Manila and they've offered me the money. I asked and they've said, Yeah, you give a full refund. I'm just, I'll believe it when the money's in the bank account. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's kind but of. But also, I looked at the other day, you know, silver linings, just trying to think of one because there's not many with this but um the australian the peso exchange rate has tanked since i booked it so i'll actually yeah. make money if they refund me back my money i'll actually make like 800 bucks oh. extra like, oh, hey, you, yeah. Yeah. you can put that back up. into put that back into the trip when you eventually go oh, be no, I'll some put more it drinks. Into the fact that i paid twelve hundred dollars <laughs> per person for flights and i'm getting a refund of like two hundred dollars or three hundred dollars per flight yeah like, true Oh, it was positive for a moment there, but yeah, I, know, just, I just, I just have to find the one positive. <laughs> but, no, yeah. but to your point, yeah, it is that. I mean, it just makes sense. I, I took my ops manager over to Manila for his first trip with the company back in, I don't know, maybe it was October. And um, he's noticed that with his team because most of his team is over there and yeah. they, they both have better rapport. They've had shared experiences. We've climbed the volcano together which then erupted four weeks later yeah. but we yeah, climbed right. the volcano together and you know you go out for drinks and meals and stuff so yeah there is a balancing act between being just so arrogantly confident about oh you know work from home independent work from anywhere thing is the future and then also yeah we are still humans and we do see need some degree of connection yeah. so i think somewhere in the middle works works well yeah, definitely. I, I think as humans, we there's not that many of us that can just be so passionate about that task that we're doing. Mm. Like it might be the best thing in the world, like the, but um, if we don't have a good team that we can kind of do that together with, um, it, for me anyway, 
the team is 99% of what I'm doing, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a spin on that. If you're before COVID and oh, I'm recruiting people to work from home, whether it's Sydney or Brisbane, right? Um, or anywhere really. Um, and what I've found has worked for us is that, and there's a, there's a theory about it, that if you work from home, the company doesn't need to be your social interaction. Mm. So there's a, there's a theme in this remote working in this industry or whatever is that you, you get your social interaction from your neighbor, from the triathlon training you're doing in the morning, like your family, whatever it is. Whereas when you go to an office, you've got to like the people you work with because you're next to them all the time and all this sort of jazz. Um, uh, where was I going with that? So what I've found with recruiting, what's worked for us when you were recruiting people remotely, like we will be doing in the next couple of months, is um, someone who has a reason to work from home. Where we failed a few times is people are like, yeah, that'd be really cool to work from home. You know, that'd be that'd be great. Yeah, it does. It's not worked twice. I'm two from two with it not working. Um, yeah. Where it has worked is where people have a reason. They have a one year old. They have dogs that they're passionate about. They are training for an elite sport. They, you know, whatever it is, they're introverts, something like mm. that. That's worked really well because they overcome some of the negatives of working from home because of the, the whole, I've got a one-year-old, so I'm going to suck it up because of uh, this part about work because of all the positive benefits I get there. Yeah. To your point, Manila, we don't have guys in an office in Manila. Our team there all work from their home still. Right, so in okay. Manila, they don't, they don't say it's busy traffic. You just say it's very traffic because there is no different type of traffic. It's just traffic. It's very traffic. <laughs> so yeah. our, our staff in Manila used to work at Google. They used to work at one of the big ad agencies uh, there. They work with one of the telcos there. And they're highly competent, qualified people. And, you know, one's an engineer. And they just now don't have to drive into Manila traffic. Or I think you, your guys are just a little bit out of Manila, but yeah, through BGC, San, San Ma yeah. Marine or something. I can't remember the name of the place. Yeah. Yeah. They're a little bit out. But the traffic, the, the reason that building, your, your company's there, because I've visited those guys, is based on the public transport. And it's on this public transport hub and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But they moved office and people freaked out. So, yeah, our reason, our work from home people in the Philippines is I don't have to go in Manila traffic. It's ridiculous. Well, we had a guy who lived, he lived outside, in, like in the suburbs somewhere, for instance. Like yeah. the way he explained to it was like Probably. from Brisbane to Wynnum, like the city to Wynnum, like where I am. Yeah. And we're like, oh, okay. Well, that's fine. Like that's normal. And then he's like, it takes me three and a half hours each, each yeah. day. And like, we didn't know that until like a couple of years in. And we're like, That's Damn. when it's not raining too. You talk to me yeah, in monsoon exactly. season. Oh, in yeah. monsoon season, he was just like, guys, I'm out. I'm not, I'm working from home today. Um, yeah. Cause in, but in reality, I think that's before I left, they were working from home a lot more because yeah. my boss was like, you guys don't need the parent company looking over your shoulder you guys are so keen on working for us because we've done all these things to incorporate you into the business that you know they'd be like one would just be like oh, on microsoft teams my wife's sick today working from home or have a soccer practice with my son working from home and we're like okay you're probably still going to do two and a half times more work than i'm going to do anyway. yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. I'm just looking uh, for a book up here which is not there one of the things that got me onto this work remotely back when I was in South Brisbane was um, this book called Remote. It's by the guys who um, created 30, uh, the company 37 Signals. They have Basecamp and High Rise, oh, yeah, yeah. The, the project management software Basecamp. And there was this one quote when I read it, and I'm just paraphrasing it, but it was saying, if you're, and this is probably what a lot of bosses have gone through in the last month or so in around the world, and it, it said, if you're worried about your staff working remotely, you're a crap manager. Mm. And I was like, that's how I, that's what I said to myself when I read it. Though I don't know if it's exactly those words, but it was like, that's the realization because he says, you're there for, if that's the case, you're currently managing by attendants who smiles, who walks fast, who um, gets back from their lunch break at an appropriate time, who's there before you, who leaves after you. That's your current management style is that. 
Yeah. And that's yeah. just a crap management style, whether you've got an office or you don't have an office. And yeah. I was like, yeah, that's, not... that's how I was managing. So that's, <laughs> but it's pretty, when you're remote, it's, it's quite transparent then because you end up managing by, and not manage, I don't love the word managing, but you're leading or you're, you're worried about deliverables. You're not worried about, uh, you know, well, they used to say, I'm not interested in pleasing methods. You're interested in pleasing results, which I've yeah. always been interested in. So that's sort yeah. of served me. Except- it's such a, that's such a, well, it's becoming an, quite an antiquated system that sort of you punch in at 9am and you punch out at 5pm and that's it. You may do only an hour's worth of work, but because you punched in at that time, you know, you've ticked the KPI, you're employee number one sort of thing. So, yeah. That's just that's just that, dumb. It is, but and again, I just try and temper my opinions. Of what do I say about myself? I got strong opinions, but held loosely. As in, yeah. I've really strong opinions, but I'm willing to learn and maybe you know and, and change them, hold them loosely. Yeah. And one of the things that sort of I've moved a little bit away from that super strong opinion is that as you grow, like that was really easy. I had no employee problems, no HR problems, no attendance problems, anything like that when I had seven staff, and now you know, with 15, they're still great people, but there's still a lot more of those things. And I yeah, think true. I was just listening to an interview that a friend of mine did with a lady who's got a team in the Philippines with 140 people. Mm-hmm. And you can't be managing by results. You can't purely be managing by results mm-hmm. with 140 people. You can with yeah. 15, 35, 140. You've got, to, you've got to have a lot of metrics in place as well too. So there is that, you know. Yeah, true. Not, there is that. Nothing. There's that balance, isn't there? Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. see these. I mean, hard- if you have 140 people in Brisbane, you you'd need some met- some pretty hardcore metrics as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think about that. But anyway, so you guys you and, are I pretty- haven't played, and I haven't played at that scale before, so we we just we just no. we haven't experienced it ourselves. Yeah, exactly. But so re- working from remote, you're obviously pretty experienced at it. For those of us who are just starting out on this thing, like for me, for instance, I'm. I'm doing okay, but, um, and I don't actually, I'm working in construction at the moment. So I'm just yep. completely, I, I'm unemployed at the moment, but even yep, yep. like, for instance, no, you're, mate, a, you're a semi-professional podcaster. Based oh on yeah, the, mate. The after this interview, yeah, after this mate, interview, mate, you wait. Yeah. Mate, you wait for the next interview and I introduce, introduce you on that one. That's, I'm going to have time to prepare for that. That's going to yeah. be beauty. Yeah, my Instagram's gonna crash. I reckon. It's just, it's just oh, no, I'm shut. old, but I don't know much about Instagram. But you know, you tell me what to say, and I can sell it. For you. <laughs> Sounds great. Anyway, so back to you. Back we'll to you, cross. Sorry. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. <laughs> um, what I was saying is, like, for instance, me for, with my uni work. So I'm studying graphic design at uni. Oh, I was only a couple of days a week, and one of the reasons that I signed up to do this uni work was it's face to face. You know, so we would go in. Yeah. Sit, in, sit in a lecture not even a lecture there's only 10 of us or so collaborate work together obviously now that's all not happening anymore it's all online and i've just sort of started i'm getting better but for the first couple of weeks it was like all right how the heck do i stay focused motivated and block out some of those distractions you would have probably a bit of experience in that, I'm guessing. I'm guessing you're not, it's still not 100% perfect. Things happen. No. But have you got any, for us that are just newbies to this, are you, have you got any sort of tips and tricks well, that you've learned? You've touched on the 100% wrong person to ask the education question to, just so you know. So I succeeded at high school. I failed miserably at university Yeah. yeah. Um, because at high school you're doing it to keep, well, not you, I've heard your background. You didn't worry about high school too much, but in you know, high school, you, you're trying to keep people happy. You know, people please them, want the teachers to be happy. Not you, me, you know, that, that sort of stuff. At university, as you well know, they don't give a rip if you turn up or not. Like they don't care if you don't submit anything, they don't care. So I did six months full-time uni with a comment, doing a commerce degree, then went at, attended Griffith, then went, this is a complete waste of time. I want to be out there making money and doing stuff. Yeah. So I went part time. So for the next two years, no. So I eventually did seven and a half years of uni over two different degrees, one of them with a full scholarship and didn't finish either of them because right. it just wasn't, wasn't your deal. Going, nah, 
just wasn't my deal. Or, you know, to your point where you just lose interest. And particularly in those two changes, I changed careers and where the course was so aligned to the career and you change the career, you're like, well, I don't yeah. need to understand prison security anymore because I'm not going to stay in the security industry. So I'm going to kind of go out of that. Um, yeah, you just change. So I can't help you with your uni work. Um, yeah, but pretend that uni work, though work. is work. But let's just pretend yeah, okay. that. Yeah. Well, it, it's a little bit harder in that for, and I've also come from the, being a boss. So if I don't do stuff, then I can, I can not, I've got a great team, particularly great exec team. So I can not do things for two, three days. I can go to Europe for 18 months, work sort of three or four hours a day. But things don't grow necessarily. They maintain or they atrophy a little bit, but not boom. Yeah. Um, so that's the danger is that I can do nothing for a little while. And then three months later, I'll go, well, I don't have any money in the bank. And it's because three months ago, I mainstreamed Blacklist or something like that on Netflix for you know three <laughs> seasons in a row. And therefore, three months later, I've got no money because I yeah. haven't been doing the business development and all that sort of jazz. So as an employee, it would be tougher be, to do nothing because that's not you as a uni student either you, because the lecturer doesn't care if you don't do it. Mm. Um, so it's, it's that carrot or a stick. You've either got the stick of a boss or a high school teacher flogging you and saying, do something, or you've got the carrot of the goal that you want at the end or the um, business that you want or the something you're motivated about to drive you. So so how to stay motivated, um, it's, it's got to be one or the other. You've either got to have a, a stick, as in you've got a big-ass mortgage that you've got to pay, and if you, lose your, if you upset your boss or lose your job, the whole pack of cards comes crumbling down, that would be a pretty decent stick. Or you've yeah. got a carrot, which is you've got a savings plan, you've got whatever it is that means you've got to you know, go in a particular direction, or you're an entrepreneur and you're, you're headed that way. Practically speaking, it's about having... Um, it's nerdy, but it's just about having lists and to-do lists. And yeah, yeah. like this, my journal sitting here, I've just started this high performance planner, it's called. Um, and it's just doing, you know, the night before writing out what you're going to do the next day. What are you, you know, a week in review? What's your message to yourself for the day? What's your top three goals and priorities? What's tasks that must be done today? Who do I need to connect with today? All these yeah, sort right. of morning mindset things, evening mindset. The guy's name. Is that the high performance habits guy? Brendan Bouchard. Yeah. Um, I've read his yeah. book. Have you? Yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, I haven't, but I've got 4 billion emails from him since buying this journal. But yeah, I got sucked into it on Instagram. I've got a year's worth. It was a good value. So yeah, for me, it's, it's become a notepad and then a, a structuring and, and plan my day out. So mm. Okay. Particularly for someone who doesn't need, doesn't have anyone telling them what to do, you can easily do nothing like I did for seven and a half years at uni, just fluffed around pretty much um, because it was all by correspondence as well too. So you can either do that or you can just set these expectations for yourself. But I, I like some of the stuff he's got in here. I don't subscribe to all of it. It's just like a mindset thing. Like one of these trick questions, trick questions he's got in here, he's saying, uh, you know, what, what's the... Da, 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 what might stress me up for the day or trip me up? And then how would my best self deal with that? So you're going to into it at the beginning of the day going, what are some potential landmines that might come up today and how, and you're already setting how you're going to yeah, get over it. Like preempting it in a way. Yeah. Yeah. That's and interesting. You've got one, you've got one in saying, if I was a high performance coach looking in at my life at a high level, what would I tell myself to remember right now? Mm. And then that's an effective question as well too, but also, High performance expects you to sort of ask more of yourself. So you end up thinking, okay, so if that's the case and you're just putting some reminders in there, some affirmations some reminders some goal orientated things. So for me, it's not, I'm not, I'm not the soup. I don't subscribe to the wake up 5am, 4am, 3am, do this structure. Here's the, maybe here's the shirt I'm going to wear for the day, but yeah, here's the, I have the same breakfast. I do all this. I don't believe in that because I'm not, not like a, not like a hard and fast routine kind of, kind no, of guy. That yeah. me. And that's me personally, because one of my highest value in some assessments I've done before is freedom. So the freedom to have, that's probably why I've navigated into having my own business, but it's freedom. Then it's, you know, financial security gives me a degree of freedom to make decisions. 
It's why um, helping people who work with me have a degree of freedom in their, their job um, is important to me. Um, yeah, anyway, so there's, there's, so I can't, I don't, if I have that structure, I don't feel that I have freedom because in the morning, if I feel like reading the paper, because I'm old and I read the paper every morning, like if I like physically read the paper, <laughs> I'm gonna, yeah. if I want to read the paper for longer, but hang on, my superstructure says, no, at 6, 12 in the morning, you do this. That just yeah. blows up my freedom, freedom value. So Yeah, true. It's that con for you. That's a conflict in your value. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's interesting. But that's there's really the Brian Tracy stuff of going also eat that frog. That's the other theory. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Or... I've heard the saying eat that frog, which is, you just... know what I mean? Is it uh, probably not, but I'm going to try. Uh, is it, it, is it just yeah, right. do that thing? do that you know that that thing that you've really got to do that you don't want to do you've just got to just smash that out first is it yeah absolutely mate. because the and the premise of it is that every day you turn up with your plate and there's a frog on it every single day mm. so you could either look at it all day and get depressed about it and then at two minutes to midnight you have to eat it but you've just pained yourself the whole day or just eat it in the first thing and then don't worry either way you're gonna to have to eat it yeah so I've done that a little bit. To, um, I've started writing lists out. So D Denny, for instance, she is the most organized list writer you've ever seen. She's a little bit different than me. Yeah. Oh, she's like this working from home thing. She's absolutely killing it. Like she just, she's in there doing her thing. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing this? So I've started writing a list. And, you know, in, for instance, one of the things I'm going, well, I'm, I'm not employed at the moment. I've got uni work to do, but this is an awesome opportunity for me to, to grow this podcast and absolutely mash out guests so as i write guests down that i want to have there's always a few that kind of something inside of me goes oh like that's like that's me scary. that's what you meant this one that's that's an example oh mate it's taken me real life example it's taken me months to book you that's yeah, for sure yeah, <laughs> no like even <laughs> i'm joking i'm not even gonna lie like even for instance for you there was a there was an element of I think it's my personality and this is deeper issues. I need therapy on this. Well, let's go into it. Let's go into you for a sec. But um, I definitely have this whole, okay, I've done 15, whatever, 16. I think this is episode 16 episodes, whatever. But I, when I go, okay, I'm going to talk to these next people. I, all these things in my head go, hmm, oh. I don't think you're there. You're not good enough for that. Like, not that you're not good enough. Yeah. You don't have the right production. And it's all stuff yeah. that you go, this is dumb. Like just do it, yeah. like get it over done. Well, it's self-worth, it's self-worth issues and imposter syndrome and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I don't know, I, I don't know many people that when you actually, and particularly my entrepreneurial mates, when you have an honest conversation with them, they know that they live and I do too, big time. And that's why it's sometimes difficult being open on something that's recorded for the rest of my life like this is that you've got imposter syndrome all day, every day. Yeah. And I've worked out that I've had that many wins in my life that come from um, not the fake it till you make it thing. Cause I don't really subscribe to that at all. Cause I think that disrespects the other, other person, yeah. um, but just doing it and, mm. and, and trust me, I, I still like, I used to really hate the network marketing business in many areas. And some of it would be like, you make a list of people you've got to call and all that sort of stuff. And I still have to do that now, cold call people and whatnot. And you're still on the phone and it's dialing and you, for some stupid reason, you're praying that you get message bank. And I'm like, mm. I've just been through 35 minutes of motivating myself and researching this person to the nth degree and all that sort of stuff. And I've finally got the guts to make the phone call and I'm praying that they don't answer the call. I'm like, how messed up is that? That you've been through 98% of the pain and you just, uh. but I think that's, that's human nature, but that's also where the wins are. That's also where the point of difference between the, the also rans and the, the real people who make a difference on the planet are the ones who sort of get outside of their, yeah. um, out of their own way. And there's a question on here somewhere about that, that I struggle to be quite frank. I struggle with every single day. I'll, um, it's kind of like yeah. that saying where they say like around, that, that around that corner there's always there's usually that corner where it's kind of like i've got a i've got a struggle right now to get around this corner but on the other side of that corner is usually where that win is because yeah yeah, yeah there's a reason I that it's been so hard to do it there's sales too it's in follow-up like just that 
next phone message that you're going to leave that next email that you're going to leave how if they're the right prospect and you've just <laughs> put yourself through the pain of emotional turmoil of contacting them why would you just let that go to nothing when you've just had all of this turmoil it's like i've been through that these guys gonna to have to pay like i find it when i'm having an office or you go drive in the city and you park somewhere like oh it's gonna be 62 dollars <clears throat> 62 dollars for a hour and a half meeting you know like, yeah, yeah. i'm walking out of here this with a contract i'm walking out of this with something signed because if i had to pay 60 bucks to parking someone else is going to pay for my park yeah yeah when this I has to be something. worth it no mm. yeah definitely when I fly somewhere, it's like i'm not coming home empty-handed this i'm not doing this and i suppose that goes back to your how do you get things done um you're not if you're not doing it for fun if you're not doing it for and this is a balancing act you might have to come across with the, the podcasting business as well too, a podcasting hobby. Is that is it a business? Is it a hobby? Because if it's something that's easy to pick up, it's something that's easy to put down. And you've already gone 15 podcasts more than what I have. And I've been, we've talked about this three years ago, I think it was. So <laughs> yeah. it's, like, it's like, you've actually gone out there and done it. And but when you know you get the new job and it's fifteen percent more salary than your last job, and I'm like, oh, was that just a phase I was in that podcasting thing, or is that actually something that's important to me? Yeah. And knowing and being okay with that answer—that's the other thing I don't like about too much discipline. Well, I'm pretty reasonably disciplined, but too much discipline and too much stru much structure is like, it's okay to have fun. It's okay to. And my version of fun is different than a lot of people, but it's like, it can be okay to be opportunistic. It can be okay to um, have the flexibility to do something now, which is like, you know what? I'm going to cancel that podcast I got for tomorrow night because, you know, we're finally allowed out of lockdown or Danny's looked at me strange and she's wanted to watch this, you know, Netflix show with me. And I know that means she wants quality time and we should sit on the couch and me yeah. having a, another podcast interview is not a good idea right now. Like yeah. rather than get that, that's a higher, that's a reason not to be too structured and, and, yeah. and know what real priorities are. I suppose. The, the way that I'm kind of doing it. Cause I think, yeah, we talked about it like three years ago and I definitely went through this. I think I did like four episodes or whatever. I remember listening know. to one of them when I was in Randwick at, at a conference and I, I listened to one of your first ones. It was, with, like, Jay, it was with um, Jace, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, he was my very first um, yeah, guest. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I listened to that one. Yeah, so I did this whole, I, you know, I was on this kind of, I guess it was like a little, a little spree. So I did four, and even those were quite spaced out because I right. was just in, not in a good mindset around it. I don't think, but something. Well, I know what it was. Literally, it, it's been something that's been in inside of me for a while. Going, you know what? Why, why can't I just have a crack at that? Like it's something I really want to do. Stop thinking about all this other stuff about why you can't do it. Just have a go. Like everybody had to start somewhere. And then this, this year I kind of made it my, I've never been one for like resolutions or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like it's a decision. what I want to do this year is do at least, at least four a month. So that's one a week for the whole year. And I'm like, well, however and, that many is. And why do you want to do that? And the, the reason that I, that I want to do that is because I want to kind of, I'm, I'm, I think I've become quite obsessed with sort of learning stuff that's going to help me go from yep. here to where I want to be. Yep. And I find in conversations with my mates and with people, I'm always like, oh, you should totally get onto this. This is what it is. Yep. And it's like, well, hang on. I want to go and search out all these people to kind of help me selfishly. Yeah. This is a great way for me to also help a lot of other people, hopefully a lot of other people by them hearing these tips and tricks and yeah. lessons to kind of be inspired as well, because I, this is a, why, why is that accumulation of knowledge? Why is that important to you? Um, I think the accumulation. You're a learner. You've, you've read all the books. You, you're a podcast junkie. Why? Yeah. Well, I I think it's the way that I've kind of begin. So I'm still processing this, but the way that I'm kind of starting to figure out is there's. And this may sound a bit weird, but like I believe there's like there's a two versions of myself, right? So there's me right yeah. now, 
And then there's this yeah. version that God's created me to be, or if you're not a Christian out there, whoever, you, yeah. you know, it's just a version of yourself that is meant to be the bo- the best version it can possibly be. And gotcha. when we both, when I die and I meet and I go to heaven, God's going to introduce me to this guy and he's going to be like, Hey mate, this is, um, this is Richo. This is the version of that I created you to be. I want to look at that guy and go, yeah, we know each other really well. I don't want to be like, Oh, you're that person that I, that I could have been. And so for me, the accumulation of knowledge is kind of how can I keep learning and growing as a human being? Mm -hmm. Cause I want to look back and go, I want to look back two weeks ago and go, I'm a better person for that. I still have to, because knowledge do doesn't make. Yeah, I was going to say, do you think it's the accumulation of knowledge that's going to make you a better person or that plus action? Yeah, it's not, it's, no, it's, it's not the knowledge. It's the, well, it's knowledge, but it's me being able to put that into action. So it's, yeah. it's the progress, I think. So, um, and obviously I'm trying to figure this out. I need to sit yeah. down and write stuff down, but I think it's that, that progress. If, if I'm not moving forward, I feel like I'm moving backwards. And so I want to keep, I want to keep going as a person. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So why is that? I've heard that analogy before about the, you know, meet the perfect version of you in heaven. It's a really like overt one. Um, And it's really, um, you know, quite engaging, I suppose. Why, why does that matter? Like, why did you know there's the perfect version of richo in 2020 walking around in a parallel universe right now why is it important to be like that the perfect version i don't know if the perfect is the right word i think it's someone who's lived li- who is living their their potential their 100 percent potential yeah. that they have i think that's probably the better way of saying it. so yeah, yeah. i i have potential the potential that i have to be so, somebody who's leaves a legacy, someone who's changing a lot of lives in this world. I want to, I want to be that person. Yeah. So that's, that's important to me because I think it's by helping those other, helping other people and leaving a, leaving a mark in this world for good. I've got to figure out the language of this, but that that, it's important to me. Yeah. Um, I think I have to figure out, I have to go deeper. How would you know if you've done that? Like, how would you, because I've, yeah. there's also a saying that I live by, which works positively and negatively. That there's always someone with a bigger boat. You know, there's always someone with more staff, more revenue, more profit, bigger boat, faster car, more push-ups, whatever. Yeah. So how do you know? Cause you're ver- like, is that other starfish stuff about, you know, throw one starfish back in the ocean, you know, it made a difference to that one. Um, Mm. it can make a massive difference to one person yeah so how do you know when you've made it then i don't i don't know if there's an actual necessarily a made it i like i don't i don't know i don't necessarily have that kind of i'll know i've made it when i've made when there's 200 million dollars in the bank i I don't that's not my thinking my thinking is more yeah i don't i I have to figure that. I have to figure this out. I think I mean, we've opened up a tin of worms. What I'm hearing is, and it's actually, I'm, I'm very interested in this stuff because it's not my natural tendency. So mm. I don't, I'm naturally task orientated, win lose, binary sort of a person. Yeah. And what you're saying is not that. Um, and and the thing of saying, you know, if you're living on your purpose, like I don't still have my purpose clear. Um, you know, you, what's your passions? I don't really have, I find those questions quite difficult to answer, always have. Um, but to you, you seem quite aligned with what I'm noticing that's going on in the world at the moment is more of a focus upon what they call flow uh, and what they, and, and I don't know if you've read Simon Sinek's most recent book called The Infinite Game. No, no uh, I haven't. That is, a, that is probably the stage and I've got a copy here. I'll post it to you um, okay. because it messed with my head too much. Um, and I couldn't, uh, to be honest, that's how much of a friction it was. So I just couldn't get through it. Mm. And it's, and it's the, it's this exact conversation we're having where he's talking about, it, it's not binary. It's not win lose. There's the, the always progressing is the game, the infinite game. 
Yeah. Um, and he gives business examples, people examples, everything. And I think it is that you're more, you're, I'm looking at the video screen with you and me together. It's more definitely your side of the video screen and might help you put some language around yeah. where you're at at the moment. Um, for mm, me, I'd... it freaked me out massively and I couldn't, I could just couldn't compute it, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting there slowly. Do you think that those two things can be combined together though? Do you, so do you think that you can be binary win lose while also having this constant progress? Do you know what? I can't answer that question as eloquently as Simon Sinek, but I reckon if you read the book or listen to the audible, you'll be able to answer it. I can only tell you my feelings on it. And what I think one of the reasons I stopped, just stopped on that audio book and reading the book was that I was getting the impression that that's a no, mm. that the answer was a no. Um, and that just really you know, did not compute for me. So uh, it wasn't really in the mind space to like throw out everything I'd previously believed and go with this path. Um, but I do know plenty of people who do and who have and who are successful and or happy mm. and living on purpose and having output and relationships and all that sort of stuff. It was just is just too far of a difference for me. Um, yeah. Cause I think I in think my, that, maybe there's a middle step. Someone could watch this video and say, Hey Michael, you re if you read this book that's somewhere in the middle, then you can then go to the next one. But I, just, yeah. I went too far down the path. <laughs> yeah. Cause I, I think if, if, if we keep talking about this for a little bit, I think in my head, for instance, um, I have like metrics, they, yeah. whether they be right or wrong, like, but they're, they're kind of, metrics that I would sort of want to see myself hit, like almost goals, I guess you would yeah, say. Sure. Um, and so they were, I think probably are a measure, but that bigger question is something that I'm, is still very great for me. It's yeah. kind of that, like, here's what I want to do short term. So for instance, my like thing is, you know, I read the book grit, which really had a big yep. impact on me. Yep. And that was kind of like, just keep, if you want to do yep. something, it's not about talent. It's a well, talent, a tiny part of it. Just keep running through those walls. So I was like, I can't, I can't compare myself to a successful podcaster if I've done 15 episodes and quit because I'm like, well, hang on. If I listen to episode 15 of most of those podcasters who I admire, they're, they're pretty average as well. You know, like yeah. the guests are awesome. But the Have you listened to Tim Ferriss's first podcast, episode <laughs> yeah. one? I think yeah. he just got hammered. <laughs> <laughs> I listened to that in France. It was a dis it was I didn't go listen to it again for like nearly six months. It was just a disgrace. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now it's like, oh now he has pretty amazing guests and a <laughs> pretty amazing podcast. Yeah, Man, you have sorry. to start like even Joe Rogan, for instance, who I listen to yep. a lot, like his the, the he was very early on, but it's literally just him with this like terrible backdrop live things coming down and him and his mates they just get drunk and talk a lot of crap you know like yeah, right. uh, but he after like 20 30 episodes then he started getting a guest and then he would do this and so yeah i've made it kind of my mission that i don't want to i don't want to reevaluate i don't want to go mm, should i quit this until i've done 100 episodes like that's a okay big so goal. you have a you have a number yeah because there's the other the other and, and it's in our brand of pivot pivotus is that there is a time, I believe anyway, there is a time where you need to, when I want to sit and reflect and pivot because you can be flogging a dead horse and someone's got to tell you or you got to just realise that it is actually dead. It's not going to come alive again. Like it's yeah, time definitely. to move off that horse. Mm. Um, and that's what rubs with me with regards to the infinite game stuff. It's like, well, if we don't have some metrics or we don't have some pass fail evaluation sort of stuff. Anyway. Yeah, no, I, and that's, I think that's where we're very similar. I kind of have those, those metrics. Like I, I, there's definitely a time I'm like, this is my dream to be a podcaster. And so I just kind of do this forever. Yeah. Like, well, no, that doesn't work. Like if there has to be a time where you go, Hmm, this is, I've done a hundred episodes and I still have, roughly the same amount of people listening as I did in episode four. Yeah. There's a reason that that's happening and it's not the listeners. Yeah. It's me, you know? So fingers crossed by the time I get to a hundred episodes and I'll, I've, I'd be trying to like 
you know, review each episode that I do and go, what worked, what didn't do work. Yeah. Cause I really geek out on that kind of stuff as well. Yeah. But, um, you know, you kind of look at it and go, this is my target. If I don't get there, that's when you have to kind of make the decision and go, Hmm. Am I, will I continue doing that? Or will I take what I've learned from that? Cause even now I've yeah. learned so much. And Heck can I yeah. go somewhere else, you know? So Heck yeah. interesting. I'm doing a similar thing, a similar thing at the moment with video. Um, we're just building, you know, the, the COVID crisis is, uh, makes people pivot. And I'd been fluffing around since November last year on a video platform, video training platform, recording videos and, and for the advertising industry. And, you know, potentially sell them or, keep, sorry, sell them or keep yeah. them for customers or something like that. And, um, yeah, it's amazing how we're going to launch with, you know, 20 to, 20 to 30, maybe about 20 videos um, in four weeks that has taken mm. me, you know, five months to do one, but it's that it's not perfect. Like I listen back to one of my videos just going, Oh, I sound like I'm asleep, but I do remember when I was there and if I wasn't, it's just my voice. And then you go, yeah. well, I should go and re-record that part. And you're like, well, if I re-record that and I'm going to re-record that. And then you just, you know, you said the other day, it's the production over perfection. Um, yeah. That's a, that's a big thing for me, which also then leads to, you know, measure once cut twice which which is probably a balancing act of where you should probably have a degree of action that's actually measured as well but yeah like they say like well, done is better than perfect but that i think that's a good saying but i i don't think it necessarily means ah uh, just chuck it out because yeah. you, you know i just 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 well, just okay. yeah whatever should be should be right like i don't think that attitude although you will release content is that content valuable to anybody? You know, oh, well, so. it's a four hour work week stuff too, where Tim talks about the, um, like that, you, you get to 92%, uh, you, you know, you're 92% good at something or done. And that extra 8% is going to take you this ridiculous amount of time for only an extra 1% a game. And yeah. it, it, I can't remember the, the, the terminology. It's like uses, that. But 80 20 is that the 80 20 principle? Yeah, no, it's a little bit more, it's a little bit different to that. So it's saying, if like he does it with languages and that's why you can learn languages because he goes, okay, I only need to learn 28 words or whatever it is in this language. And that will get me 87% of conversations I'll be able to do. But yeah. if I want to do the final 13% of conversations, I've got to learn another 3000 words. So yeah, yeah, that's not the right, that, that's the tipping point for just not being worthwhile. It's like how they show more, like, yeah, like athletes, professional athletes, like a swimmer, there's a certain amount of a level. It'll usually take the certain amount of same amount of time for everybody to reach this kind of say to be yeah, to yeah. get to the Olympics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But to kind of be Michael Phelps and to get that fervor in front, there's so much more work and, and there's talent well, there as also well. Also have a double jointed chest and a double jointed everything else and that kind of that pays yeah. off as well too. Is that yeah, a, exactly. another one on that thing as we're going down analogies path? When you're looking at studying people, I was tipped off to don't study number one in anything. Don't mm. study number one because they've generally got some freak of nature thing that you just can't duplicate anyway. So mm. Michael Phelps was an example in there where they're talking about you're not going to be able to duplicate him because of his size of his feet. He's got a, a, a you know a, a double jointed chest cavity or something rather, which is like ridiculously unheard of. So if you look at his training regime and you train like him, you're still not going to get the same results. So their analogy is look at number two and three, particularly yeah. around number three, because they've had to struggle and fight to get to number three. Mm. And you can do that because that's just grit. Number yeah, one is more than grit. Number one is like freaking nature. Number three is just grit. And you've read the book, you know how to do it. Just do grit. Yeah, so, exactly. That's super interesting. I'd never heard that before. That's really interesting. Well, you look at them, look at, I mean, I was going to say Lance Armstrong, bad example, but it is another example of, you know, if you're trying to follow his regime and you don't know the secret sauce on the side, like there's, there's lots where it's just not worth looking at number one. You admire yeah. them, but if you're going to copy someone or emulate someone, emulate two or three, because you've got yeah. a better chance of being like that. Yeah. I guess if you're looking at that from like a podcast kind of view and podcasts are different, I guess, because there's you're not just you're not all doing exactly the same thing but say you, you, joe rogan i would say is probably the biggest podcaster out mm. there like his list he is stan he was a stand-up comedian ufc commentator 
he started like be- pretty much before anybody else. So if you compare yourself to him, you're like, hmm, okay, that, there's there's obviously some other factors there that have helped him. Look at yeah, say the yeah. yeah, look at say number even three, four, five, and go, well, what's their story and how did they get there? You know, like that's well, maybe even scale it down because if three, four, and five is still looking at millions of listens, which oh, is yeah. just mind blowing for someone like yeah. yourself. Maybe look at someone who's double or triple your average listens. Yeah. And that's, you know, I'm just totally making up numbers here, but if you've got a hundred listens and then you, you're trying to look at someone who's got 300, that's super achievable. Mm. And then once you're the 300, you'll go to the, the 600 listens or whatever. I'm just making these up 600 listens. But if you go from you to Joe Rogan, Michael Phelps, with all due respect, that's never going to happen. For nah. many, many reasons, which you've just mentioned, ten of them. You know, exactly. Time that you come back, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd maybe scale it down and start to look at some people who are, you know, three times your average listens and much go, more can, achievable. Yeah, so you'll, you'll listen to it and you'll go, "You're flipping kidding me! This idiot's got three times what I'm doing." Like, yeah. I can do that, and then yeah, and off you go. Yeah, that's um, yeah. I'll that's do that. why I look more like goal setting, and there's always someone with a bigger boat. So just find. And it's also just find something you're happy with, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. I'm looking at a book up here. If you're talking about your wife. Have you read um, um, this book called Quiet? No. The Power. No. It's the book for me and your wife, which is, well, no, it's for you. But it's the book, it's called Quiet. It's by Susan Cain. It's called The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. Mm. So for all these podcasters and all these extroverts and all that sort of stuff, if you ever have to live with an introvert or work with an introvert or design an office for an introvert or whatever, um, they talk about introverts at church. They talk about introverts in offices. They talk about introverts in team building. It's a really good book. Um, yeah, right. Okay. Your wife's personality versus yours, which um, is a little bit different from each other. Yeah. They They're a little bit different. <laughs> We have some similarities, but we, we have a lot oh, of differences. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> opposite the track, and then they just infuriate the buggery out of each other. In in, in my experience, but maybe yeah. not your. Nah, experience. I'm pretty I'm pretty efficient at doing that. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a master's in being annoying, unfortunately. But yeah, yeah, but yeah, so, yeah. A bit of fun. So that's another book. I don't know what other ones up there. Nah. No. I just. I I just fall, I just finished. Uh, it's uh, you know Jocko Willink at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What was it Good called? Night. Extreme Great. Ownership or something? I think. Yeah. Extreme yeah. Ownership. That was an awesome book. I really enjoyed. He uses you, like you like these and you like these extreme full on guys, don't you? Like you don't pick mm. the six hundred podcast guy. You pick the flipping end of it. Jocko's the end of it. Yeah, I. Yeah, I kind of. I think. So that doesn't work for me. That's interesting. Yeah. I just find it interesting. I um that Enneagram stuff, like I don't I don't yeah. like I don't subscribe to everything it is. I don't because I don't think it rules your life. But I'm so I'm an Enneagram three, which is an achievement. I've never done it. I've just been labeled by my wife and uh, friends, yeah, I but... hate it when people sort of like love labeling everybody and they kind of put people in boxes. But so I have a three, which means I'm an achiever. So I'm like sure. constantly looking for that. And so and one of the things that I have to do, have to check myself is I'm always going, uh, let me find the best person at that. That's yeah. what I want to model myself off. But as where we've discussed, that can cause a lot of internal conflict. <laughs> <laughs> That's my life. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. So I'm it's interesting. i my phone for another one. Have you come across David Goggins? Have you oh, read yeah, his book? Yeah, yeah. He's, I haven't read his yeah. book. No, I want to read no, well, his book. Though. I just looked it up in Audible then, which is I'm only, I've got 10 hours and 36 minutes left because I got so far into it and it is so full on and his life bringing up was so tough, but his attitudes are so full oh, on that I was just insane, like, hey. yeah, too much. Yeah. And I don't think I'm a loser, but I just don't think I need to be around. It just doesn't find me. I know people that does, but that stuff, the Goggins and the Jocko and that it, it just doesn't doesn't do it for me. Yeah, right. that's what gets me going. Oh, really? Oh, well, I yeah. mean, that's how I got recommended it. I was like, yeah, yeah giddy up. Yeah, that's interesting. It's so interesting how di- different people. Hey, but I think 
there's pros and cons to both, but I think, yeah, definitely it's, you can look at those people and go, yeah, I want to do that. I don't necessarily want to be like David Goggins. I'm sure he's a really nice, awesome guy, but I'm not interested in running barefoot through the canyons or something like, <laughs> um, but beast. I admire his, his drive yes. and work ethic. And things yeah. Like that, you know? Oh, don't get me wrong. I um, completely uh, admire and respect what they've done that to them. But for me, it doesn't, like you said, it really fires you up. It doesn't do that to me. It mm. is the almost opposite of like, it's almost demotivating. That, that's how it works for me because it's that, I'm never going to be that good, so why even get started? So it's the, it's the interesting podcast level you're in as well too. And it's all about don't meet your heroes and to bring it back to advertising, I've had it a little bit lately because we've had such good retention in our business that we haven't had um, many new staff come on board because people don't leave. And and I've had a few lately and, and just in other areas of learning more about the industry. And you just talk to some people who worked at companies that you used to admire and you're like, oh my gosh, they're a dead set mess. Not the person, the company, they're a dead set mess, but I held them in this massive high regard and whatever it is. It's just, I don't know how I got on that tangent. I just thought about it. Speaking of tangents, no. do you have, do you have audible? Um, I didn't. I, I've listened to audiobooks before on it, but, um, Apparently I have Amazon Prime. I accidentally, this is why Jeff Bezos is so flipping rich. He, um, I accidentally signed up for a year's worth of Amazon Prime. Um, no, which is only, yeah. only 50 bucks or something, I think. Oh, that's to, great. That, in, but, that includes delivery too. Yeah, so you get delivery, you get to watch the, watch the show, like the Amazon streaming services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also apparently they, because they own, Amazon owns Audible. There's um, yeah. I don't think it's oh, free, okay. but I think there's some discounts. I was gonna say, I'll, I'll send. I know we're meant to be having a podcast on the general chat, but I'll send you the infinite game, Simon Sinek, on that. Because also for people, I listen to your podcast on the on videos. I don't know if people do this much. I do because ADD and also get lots of things done and whatever. I just speed up the video. It's probably too yeah. late to tell you now, people. But if you just look, there's a cog on the bottom right hand side. Click on that. Go at 1.75 times. Yeah, smash through it. Get in there. Yeah, I did that with a book. Uh, I can't remember which book it was on Audible a couple of years ago. And the yeah. narrator had this beautiful voice, but it was so slow. And so yeah. I was like, I got to speed you up, buddy. And it changed my life. I was like, oh, this is it. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever done the opposite where you're used to being on two times and you start on zero and you're like, has this person got something? Yeah, like a speech impediment or something. Them or something in their life because this is really <laughs> slow the way they're talking. And it's like, no, you just listen to everything at two times. I said 1.75 would be nice. I so normally do two times, but it's like two yeah. times. Yeah, well, when I'm listening when I'm washing the dishes and listening to Richard, I can do it on two times. So it's well, <laughs> well, man, well, this what, other work from home stuff, what other work from home stuff do you want to tackle or or remote working uh, or well, cover the big thing? Yeah, I reckon so. We kind of covered that. There's a few sort of questions that I had that I would be remiss it. that I would be remiss if I didn't ask because they've been sent in from uh, from people. Tell me about the about, lawn. That, about, about who? Your, oh, your lawn. Oh, this is a stitch up. This is a stitch up. <laughs> no one other than my wife, I think, knew that I was doing this. So, <laughs> tell me about the lawn right. support group that you're in. If that's All right. You're wanting to be successful. You need to up your marketing game. It's not a lawn support group. It's a Facebook group with over 47,000 people in it. And I'll give a shout out to uh, um, Lawn Fanatics. Uh, it's now called, it was Australian Lawn Fanatics, now called Global Lawn Fanatics because he had a, uh, a um, April Fool's Day, and <laughs> silly bugger, April Fool's Day, change the name of the group but doesn't realize that it takes 28 days before Facebook lets you change it back. <laughs> so hopefully no one steals his domain or Facebook domain in the meantime. No. No, I find that quite interesting. It's also keeps me from bothering my wife because I look at Facebook videos of guys with, and that's the other thing. It's like, there's always guys with better lawns. Mm. So yeah. Grass it keeps is always me motivated. Greener. But some of the, nah, I see what you did there. Oh, <laughs> grass is, the grass is greener where you water it. That's the other yeah, one. Yeah, but no, I do like that. What other questions has my wife sent in for you? Anything? Uh, anything the only other one, there was, a, there was one to do with apparently Philippines karaoke. I was... Um, yeah, I, know, no I was, video 
there's yeah, a, there's a rule that said. says if, yeah, yeah, there's a rule that says it's phones down. You can take photos, but you can't do video. Yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, I tell you what, karaoke is pretty amazing. Not for me. I'm terrible. I really, really, it's probably the introvert. I really enjoy going there and just admiring people who are amazing singers. But you're around musicians. I'm like musically disadvantaged. I got my family's been like kicked out of playing the recorder at school. Like it's <laughs> we are genetically predisposed to being terrible at anything musical. Except my Not son. Even. He's no, my son is great at uh, at, at uh, percussion and whatnot. But yeah, right. The rest no good. So I like I like uh, listening. But then, um, yeah, but yeah, they love karaoke and and <laughs> family karaoke. Just so everyone knows it's um K K twenty one or wherever it's called family karaoke. Not the, I'm all the I'm. There's no judgment here. I'm all for it. I actually enjoy karaoke. Uh, we've been to cover some of those karaoke bars, like where it's just a booth. It's good fun. In where about in Australia? Uh, yeah, there was one in the city we went to for you know Liz White, um, John and Liz. Yeah, I know Liz. We, we went awesome. for her birthday, so we all went there. It was actually hilarious because. That would have been good. She's a, she's a muso. Jono's a singer. He would have been around. Yeah, that's yeah. not... You've got to get karaoke where people are just not... Oh, well, one of the things that we did, though, so they had this uh, iPad thing and you can choose the yeah. choose the songs and stuff. On it, you could change, like, the pitch of the... Um... Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah so we, we're I about... wouldn't have been able to do that. No, so without telling, no one else knowing. So this, you know, start singing the song and then we would just change the pitch. And so they think, oh crap, like I'm going out of tune here, but we're just adjusting it. And it, it got insane. After a while, there was people, don't do that, turn it off. And then you'd sneak in and do it again. See, this is how bad I am. I actually don't know what pitch means. So wow. that's how you, that's, we're on a totally different wavelength. I don't know here, how mate. to explain that's... the pitch. Yeah, I'm not probably, I'm sure. No, we've, like got a mutual, we've got a mutual friend, Luke, who'll be pleased to know that he's going to have to get this far in the video down here. I mentioned his name, but uh, he'll be pleased to know he was mentioned in here, one of your prior guests. But he asked me about music at the uh, church and, you know, where we were sitting, was it good today? And I'm like, mate, I can't even tell if they've got your recorder or whatever the microphone turned on. Like, what? That's what I, <laughs> I said to Daddy. Like, oh, could you, hear, could you hear my bass today, Daddy? Like, and she's like, I don't know how to listen for bass. I'm like, oh, what do so I you try? Don't listen, you don't listen for bass, Danny. You feel it. That's yeah, that's thing. why I said, I've said, oh, you'll know when it's not there. Trust me. <laughs> but that's about so it. No, the only other it, one. It's no karaoke video, sorry. But yeah. um, I had a great time for asking. No, the, only la the only other one, and we can kind of wrap up on it, is um, apparently you have a real hero in Harvey Specter from Suits. <laughs> and how... <laughs> How can you possibly aim to be like him if you're intent on working remotely and not in the uh, the corporate world? <laughs> That's a dead set stitch up that one too. That was like this is this is um, hopefully Pastor Jason's not listening to this one, but this was um, living in France, bored, having hair down to here, a beard out to here, and just looking like a hobo and living like one too, and then got on the suits and decided that that was the lifestyle I wanted for myself was that deal, deal making. It's not just that like, it's, you know, he goes to meetings, doesn't carry anything because he doesn't oh, need yeah. it. You can just do it's this They don't do stuff. any paperwork in that law firm. It's crazy. Mate, there may be, it may be the reason I started drinking scotch. That could be the other thing. Just being super transparent with you. Was, yeah. That was it. And uh, yeah, I think we might just leave it there. Do you um, have like a record? <laughs> do you have a big record collection in your office? No, I don't. Oh. No, I don't. <laughs> or the, that's where I get tempered by being the family man. There's not everything about Harvey that I admire. <laughs> don't get me wrong, but by being the family man and you know being wiser with my money, um, I'm not much of a dust collector either. So yeah, I don't <laughs> yeah. collect many things except lawnmowers. Them. You can tell my wife I'm starting to collect lawnmowers. So yeah, well, I was I was told not to reveal the source of these questions, but um, I think I think the game's well and truly up on that one. The fact I only told one person I was chatting to you, so uh, yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting. We can do that afterwards. Sounds good. Well, mate, thanks so much for chatting. It's actually been we've covered so much stuff as I was thinking about it. 
which is great. Gone from tangent to tangent to tangent, but I actually think people probably uh, learned something from that, which is hopefully they did. So. Well, how are you going to summarize it? So you can't say the word awesome in your intro because you say it all the time. Yeah, so it's something I'm working you on. Can't say, yeah, you can't say I had so much fun because it's not really fun. It's just me. So how are you going to describe this chat? Hmm. This is well, not... You put me on the spot here. This usually takes That's me 20, 25 takes to do, to do that, and it's still not good. Um, I don't know. Oh, what is it? I'll, I'll, I'll have to give it to you. I um, just had a... What is it? Just how to catch up with Michael Peterson from Pivotus. I've known him for a couple of years, but I only catch up really once a year at Christmas parties because our wives work together and we're both handbags. Uh, we talk about everything from books for introverts to karaoke to mowing the lawn to offshoring uh, stuff in the Philippines, how to work from home successfully, tips on having a diary and having goals, the difficulty with having goals, realizing that there's people always going to beat you how to eat frogs and many other yeah, things in this many episode. Other, many other things. Yeah, that's that. Well done. That's what I need by the hundred. That's my metric. By the hundredth episode, I want to be able to do that. So. All right. That's all. That's called doing Amway and having to think on your feet when you're in someone's lounge room, and you don't want to be there, but you want the result, and yeah. you just have to think on your feet. Yeah. And is is that something, I know we're just going to wrap up, but is that something you just had to learn from experience? Like, did you have, or was that Well, yeah, it's not my natural intent. I'm not a, as you well know, I'm not a people, really a people person, although I'm in sales and business development, that's for a different reason by nature. Yeah. And I'm loving lockdown. Like, I'm living my dream here at the moment. Yeah. I've mowed the lawn twice last weekend. So yeah. it's like, play table tennis, play cards with the g girls, mow the lawn a couple of times, read a book, watch movies, stay at home. That's like brilliant for me. So yeah, it was totally outside my comfort zone. But um, the old saying is everything you want is outside your comfort zone. And for me, I wanted the finances, I wanted the business asset, I wanted the recognition, I wanted the trips. And that didn't come from being an introvert who didn't talk to people. Um, yeah. So yeah. yeah. Just having to having to get it done, kind of thing, you know. That's, yeah, that's that, eat that frog, mate. Yeah, every yeah. single day. Yeah. Anyway, mate, I've waffled too much. Good to chat. <laughs> it's very good to chat. That's a good place to end, I think. So, mate, it's been awesome. Thank good you stuff. so much, everybody, for listening, and uh, I'll see you in the next episode. Bye, everybody. See you, Richard. See ya.